Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to part four of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. We're getting into some valuable insights from this week's guests that you can definitely apply to your own journey. Please definitely stay tuned for advice and inspiration that can help us all. If you missed the first part of the week in part one, two, and three, definitely go back. The show notes should be filled with all the links, so go and click on them if you need to catch up. Also, definitely subscribe to the channel and all the other ones if you can. It's going to really help the show. But for now, enjoy the rest of the story. What do I know? I know how to create um, a, a healthy body physically because that was the, my upbringing was training, always training, training, training. So I went back into training and I started to just really look after my physical health. And, you know, at the same time, I was still drinking, occasionally doing drugs, but I was doing something good for myself, something positive. And yeah. then from there, I was just like, okay, what can I change next? What can I change next? So, yeah. well, when did you slowly stop taking, I assume you stopped taking the drugs. When did you stop? Did you stop taking the drugs I mean, eventually? Yeah. Yeah. And how long, long the drugs how long down the drugs was a lot easier than stopping the alcohol. Um, so getting off drugs was easy. Uh, it was easy to say no to the drugs, but it was hard to say no to the drinking because of such a social aspect, you know, and yeah. the environment and the people I'd found myself in was, that's just how we socialize, you know, that, that's, that's what we do. We, we work hard and then after work, we'll have our drinks together. Then yeah. we'll see you in the morning. Um, it, it, so the alcohol it's wasn't connection, right. isn't it? Yeah, it was connection. Yeah. It was connection. Sorry, the drugs wasn't hard, but yeah, the alcohol was a different story. Was it hard? Uh, were they hard drugs, though? Um, thankfully, I was scared shitless of needles, so I never went <laughs> too hard on the drugs. <laughs> yeah, this big tough guy that's <laughs> afraid of needles. <laughs> but um, you know, the strongest drugs I could get that didn't involve taking a needle, that was me. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Thanks for being vulnerable again there of admitting you're scared of little needles. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the the point from uh making these small subtle changes to um coming out the other end, how how long of a period would this have been? Years? Yeah. Months. Yeah, years. Yeah. Long period of time. Years, years. Years to reprogram just conditioning from my childhood and yeah. to, to slowly step away from such a big identity. And um, so it took many, many years. I, I had to take on a job where it was more or less like a dry camp. So there was no alcohol. We had to fly to this um to an island where, you know, it's very, very hard to get drugs. Not that I was taking drugs back then, but I was still, you know, even though I was cutting down my drinking, I was still a heavy drinker. But um, by going to this job, all they sold was four mid-strength beers a night. That's all you were allowed. And I don't drink mm -hmm. beer. So I stayed on that job for almost two years and that job got me off alcohol because I couldn't drink. I wasn't drinking alcohol for that four weeks that I was working. Mm -hmm. um, and that got me back into the gym even stronger because all I was doing was um, go to work, train, eat, sleep, and then more or less repeat. And the only time I'd go to the pub was just to socialize and I'd, I'd grab a Powerade or something. And, that's where things started to shift even faster for me because it was giving me that power back where I could say no. And then when I'd come home on my break, where it'd be like you organize boozy, boozy days, it was like, oh, we're going to get on it. And I was like, I'm actually okay. Like, I don't feel like yeah. I need a drink. And, um, and when you start to change that part of you, you start to drop off certain people, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. How old were you at this point? Uh, about 26, 25, 26. Because mm. then you went on a bit of an adventure just shortly after that, didn't you? Um, you went on a new business adventure. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was that time, actually, because um, I was on that, that job, so things was feeling good. I was, uh, my health and fitness was right up there, and I started thinking more about the future positively, and I was like, do I want to be in construction my whole life? I was like, what could my exit plan be? So I uh, jumped on, uh, a mate of mine wanted to open a gym. So the two of us, we we started a gym together. And then from there, I, I decided to open a gym with my two younger brothers. And um, yeah, it's just, just positive, positive things were slowly happening or things that I could never have dreamed of if I stayed as that person or living that lifestyle. Um, so, yeah. And, and, and this is where, where, where does Sherelle come into it at this point? Had you already met Sherelle when you opened the gym or was it after? It was, it was after. So I met her when we opened the gym. Um, so she was a client. Um, she was, um, yeah, so we, well, you know, because it was such a small boutique gym, we got close with all our members. Um, and it wasn't until I lost my nephew where we started to talk more. And she was in a relationship when she was at the gym, and I was also in a relationship. But um, when my nephew passed, we'd both been single for a few months, and we started talking, and she was just checking up on me. Um and yeah, that was, it was a pretty dark time because I'd still have to go away and work and I wasn't sleeping. And, you know, she was, she was always checking up on me when I was away and it was just really appreciative to have someone I could, I could talk to because, you know, once, once the funeral had ended, as life goes on, but at the same time, it's like, how do we go on? Yes. So yeah, she was, she was a, a massive support for me back then and, just the more we spoke and connected and we sort of started to realize we had a lot of values that were uh, intertwined and the same and we wanted the same things and and then it got to a point where we were like hey do you want to go out and do something and so yeah the rest is history as they say yeah and and, and, well as everybody knows she's a a bit of a psychologist and knows her stuff when it comes to holding space and emotions she obviously was a a great emotional support for you at that moment in time how how much have you how much have you taken from Sherelle over the years because she knows her stuff everyone can see it online how has she how has she helped you uh for starters, she's a, a great psychologist. You know, when, when I found out she was a psychologist, I guess I was like, okay, what does that even mean? You can read my mind. And I guess she kept, <laughs> Are you she kept assessing me right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but she's she's really good at leaving her work stuff at home. She can take that hat off quite easily. Um, mm-hmm. But the support that she gave me and still gives me to this day is – you know, second to none, like every relationship that, you know, that wants to go far in life needs a partner who's willing to support you through thick and thin, you know, and Sherelle's been that person for me. She's seen me at some of my lowest days and, you know, we've rode the waves of the highs together and, um, given her background in psychology, she's helped me make sense of emotions and empathy, always led by myself where, you know, she's created that really safe space where I can say, hey, what's, I sort of feel like weird. She's like, okay, what do you mean by weird? And she she knows how to investigate it a bit deeper. And, um, I think we're talking about it before. I've only really experienced anxiousness once. And I I remember chatting to her and I was like, I feel feel like there's tightness in my chest and I feel like I'm trying to avoid something. And um, she was like, it sounds like you're anxious. And I was like, okay. She's like, have you ever felt anxious before? I was like, no, I've never felt anxious before. 
she was like, okay, it really sounds like you might be feeling really anxious. And I was like, cool. Well, I don't like that, so I might switch that off. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, yeah. If it wasn't for her, my transformation of where I am today, the amount of growth I've had, I wouldn't be where I am today without her guidance and her support because she's helped me make so much sense of um, what I'm feeling in, in order to move uh, faster in the direction I want to move in. Yeah. You, you said about switching off anxiety. Um, were you able just to switch it off? Because I didn't experience anxiety until I was like 32, 33. I actually looked at it as, pe as a weakness. Now I know it's the byproduct of fear. Um, and I understand it probably at a cellular level. How, how, how do you, do you, could you switch it off or did you still have to work on that? On that? Uh, I chose not to switch it off. And I huh. chose to instead to deal with what was making me anxious. The root cause. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's like, okay, if this is anxious or anxiety, I don't like it. How do I get rid of my anx anxiousness or what's causing me anxiety? All yeah. right, let's deal with that. Agree. Yeah. We, we, we're we going through, I feel like, I don't know how you feel about this, but I see it every day in schools and I see it everywhere in life and society, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel like we are trying to just deal with the anxiety in, in face value rather than going to the root cause. So we're becoming very reactive opposed to being proactive and, go, and, and dealing mm. with the root cause. Cause we, we all have trauma to a certain point or, uh, or everybody has trauma in their life or has had trauma, but it doesn't have to be traumatic anymore. And, and I think some people don't understand how to differentiate the, the two, right? If we can take an emotion out of a, a traumatic event, it, it doesn't have to be traumatic anymore. It can be wisdom. We can use it as wisdom. Uh, that's what I feel that I'm trying to do. Uh, and, and I think the podcast, the podcast for me is symbolism of that. You know, I'm trying to turn it into wisdom and share pe other people's stories. Um, how do you feel with that? Do you, do you, even with working though, with those children, those teens, what, what's your point of view on root causes and, so dealing just being reactive to the motions that we face every day yeah well it's it's um it's do you want to feel this and it's Sit going to it. come up again yeah like yeah if if not with this it will be something else so what is it that you're really afraid of and what's your worst case scenario and is it really going to be that bad or are you making your anxiety worse by overthinking and creating this massive um this this scenario to be more big than it actually is and you know it's when i'm coaching or mentoring these boys something we always come back to is courage can I be courageous enough to sit with this, to understand and dig a bit deeper of where it's coming from? And now, can I be courageous enough to take it on, to, to do what's necessary to either remove it or to step away from it? Um, and as you are saying before, like and, and another thing, what people try to do with anxiety or depression is doctors want to medicate you and it's not removing the problem it's just making you numb and, and masking what's really happening and it's creating your you're then becoming a shell of who you're meant to be um so when i i coached my son's rugby team this year they're only under sevens and before the game, I'm like, oh, we got some big kids over there. They're like, yeah, they're big, coach. And I'm like, wow, who here can find the courage to tackle that biggest guy over there? And then they all put their hands up. I'm like, that's awesome. Because what we need right now, it doesn't matter how big they are, but if we can be courageous right now, then we can work as a team and we can get through this. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, so show me hands up. Who's going to be courageous? And they put their hands up and then, you know, we start playing on the field and they might get knocked over. And I'm like, oh, mate, that was 
that was amazing what you just did then. I could see you trying to be really courageous then. I was like, just breathe with me. And we'll do some breathing. And I was like, you feel good? And they're like, I feel good, coach. I'm like, all right, let's go. So, um, yeah, it's I, I try to I'm trying to give these young kids, teenagers or young boys, whether it's my son's mates or or, or teammates, that safe space that I never had, where they can still be those masculine boys, but they're also allowed to know that, hey, you fell down, you're crying, you're hurt, you're feeling all these emotions, and you know what? It's okay. Breathe yeah. with me. And then are you ready? Are you ready to go back out there? And it's like, yeah, I am. Cool. Mate, you're doing awesome. Let's go. That was a beautiful moment because when when you were talking then, I'm visualizing your dad and hearing you, and they're just polar opposites. Um, are you? Do you work really hard not to bring that mentality of what you experienced as a kid into that coaching? Or do you find it quite comfortable no, and easy it's, it's, because of the work that you've done? Yeah. Because of the work that I've done, I find it quite easy. But mm -hmm. I also know that what my father was doing is important is his delivery wasn't the best. Like, I still yeah. believe that we need strong men who can protect themselves and protect others, but mm. that shouldn't be the man's sole purpose. Like, yeah, it's, it's also what I've, you know, what I've come to realize since becoming a father and also a husband to a psychologist is that we need to create safe spaces not just for ourselves or our partners, but our children. Like, we've got to remember our children are just that, they're children. And in order for us to, I guess, you know, if, if our children are the seeds and we're wanting to help them uh, grow, you know, and to use fertilizer and water and all that stuff, it's we've got to make sure that we create that safe space where they get knocked down, we're we're not coming down hard on them to say they've done something wrong. It's like, hey, are you okay? Like what I got from my wife was that I needed to bring myself down to my son's level because, you know, being six foot one and he's this tiny kid, and even though I thought I was creating a safe space, which to a certain degree I was, I could create an even safer space if I got down to his level. And I just sat with him. And sometimes it wasn't about talking. It was more about just being there in that presence and not having any other intention but waiting for him to feel the emotions, let the emotions go. And then when he's ready, giving him a hug and be like, mate, I hear you. I feel you. I was like, is there anything you want to talk about? And it's... It's like, I'm here for you. Like, there's nothing you can do that will change how I feel otherwise. Yes, you had a tantrum. Yes, you feel this way. But guess what? I still love you and life's going to go on. Yeah, I mean, a beautiful man. And I, I, I'm always learning that. And I sometimes <laughs> find myself in that sticky, messy pit and try and pull myself out. But emotions are running high and then... Fuck, I need to get back into the space you've just, you know, explained. And so a lot of that, what you've just said is kind of like that bringing that old school mentality, but being, being with the modern feel. Do you yeah. know what I mean? We, we don't yeah. want to bring that old school into the modern society because we know that doesn't work. But I feel like we've come too far on the other bit and, and now as well, where we're not preparing these children. But the way you are is, don't, by, don't get me wrong, but the, the society way of doing things, we just, we want to distract these children now by giving them things to do constantly and no delayed gratification. And I feel like we're just not preparing the children for the real world that we're living in when we're older. So I feel like the yes. perfect way, not that there is any perfect way, but close to perfect is bring this old structure, like you say, m man to be men still, uh, uh, and, but show, but be, feel safe to be vulnerable as well and bring the, bring the insecurities to the table so they can feel safe to come out of them in a real safe way, natural way. So old school mentality, but with the modern feel, put your hands together. That's kind of how I think of it in terms of teaching, education, parenting, friendship, you know what I mean? Family, 
you know does that does yeah, that make sense on. yes yeah. on. that's exactly uh, what i've come to realize is that my upbringing it is as hard as it was there's a lot of it that was still necessary but i was mm. missing elements that could have helped me really thrive and yeah you know my program now is called thriving sons and you know i've called it thriving sons because there are things that can be improved where just that one small tweak could be that big difference from you know taking them out of survival to actually thriving in life and having this domino effect where everything just clicks so yeah yeah well while we're talking about all this energy um i did ask you to teach me about the energy that you have learned over the years when it talks about, I don't know if I'm saying it rightly, so forget me if I'm wrong, but we did speak about it in our pre-interview about the, the Reiki. Yep. yep. Is that, am I saying that right? Yeah, Reiki. So my journey has led me to learning a few, uh, you know, learning different modalities. Like while I was on my growth journey and my transformation, I'd get to these points where I would still have these low moments. And, um, you know, physically I feel good, but mentally my mind would just lapse into these funks and I could be in these lows for days or weeks. And sometimes it would take Sherelle to like, ask me like, are you okay? Because it, you, you, you seem like you're struggling or you seem different. And then I'd be like, oh, wow. Yeah, no, I'm not okay. Um, and it sort of got to a point where it's like, what I've done has got me so far. And in order to take that next step, I need to try something different. And um, Sherelle signed me up to a, a men's program. It was an eight week program. And uh, I was first introduced to breath work in, in this program. And the breath work itself was life changing again and exactly what I needed in that moment. Uh, but from the breath work and experiencing um, experiencing breath work, but also having that hesitancy and about trying breath work and just having that masculine view of, I don't need this, to actually experiencing and thinking, oh my gosh, this was exactly what I needed. Um, what yeah. else is similar to breath work that I could try? And then I tried Reiki. And, um, so Reiki is, it's a healing practice where you're, tapping into that divine energy and the energy of the person um and it's you're, you're just laying hands on them softly and you're more or less just tapping into that 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 energy whether it's from a creator you believe in but you know i'm a very spiritual person and i believe we're all energy and for me it's just tapping into your energy and my energy and the energy for my ancestors and just allowing myself to give you a moment's peace and relaxation, and allowing, I guess, my my calm energy to just settle your mind and bring you to a place of peace, and somewhere where you can, you know, be happy with yourself. And so, yeah, Reiki was a big thing for me as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, definitely something I never, ever, you know, if I, if I was to go back 10 years ago and be like, dude, you're going to do this thing called breath work uh, and you're going to do another thing called Reiki. And I'd be like, look, man, I just want to drink my drinks and go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Same for me, uh, actually. And, you know, it's bizarre because the more I, I've read a book called Breathe, uh, I've interviewed quite a few breath work coaches um, on the podcast as, as well. Um, and I do, uh, and I know we will talk about it, but it's bizarre breath work because if you look at those techniques and those cultures going back tens of thousands of years before even farms were invented, ten, you know, I think the first village farm was not village, but first farm was formed around 10,000 years ago. But before that we had cultures that would do and going way beyond the Greeks and, you know, the Vikings and whatnot, but we had people who would do breath work. And there's literature to support uh, thousands of years worth of these tribes and, and villages and cultures doing this. It, it feels like the last 
couple of hundred years, probably more, I don't know the exact number on that, we've just decided not to, we've just ignored all of that. And it's only, what, maybe the last 10, 20 years since we've really started to focus on mental wellness versus mental health as a breathwork has become back into play again. And it's mm. people are now seeing the power in it uh, and how it elevates the, the positive, more desired emotions. Because it really does when that, you know, the more I read, what creates energy is uh, is oxygen and nutrients. And if we put those, and obviously a lot of categories fall into the nutrient section, you know, sun and food and whatnot. But you put those things together, that can create energy. I mean, I know we're probably talking a little bit of a di different energy, but breath work really, I started doing breath work in, in the cold spa, doing my cold exposure. And I really, it really gets me through that. I don't even feel it anymore. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's so powerful for me. I, I, I wouldn't say I probably do it at the level you do maybe, but even the level that I do has benefited me even just with my anxiety alone and my clarity, my yeah. brain fog, um, my mental wellness, uh, feeling present, all of those things, uh, uh, massively, massively helped me. Um, this is probably a nice time to bring in your personal development. If people were seeing you every morning or every day or how often, how often you ever do it, what would your personal development journey look like every day to get yourself up and be successful each day? Uh, for myself, it's like yeah. having non-negotiables. So, you know, it's, if I don't have a cold shower, Every day, I feel like I'm not challenging myself. And it's like, if I don't challenge myself, something else will challenge me. So by having a cold shower, it's getting over that first mental barrier of I can't to I can. Mm. Yeah. Um, exercising is also a, a must for me um, to move my body, but also it's, you know, it, it, and it's challenging when you have children, you know, like. Yeah. And then you have a second and almost a third. So I try to train, you know, I put a, a minimum three days a week, but I always try to hit four or five sessions a week. And sometimes, you know, it, it's just push-ups and chin-ups, you know, depending on what the kids will give me. Um, I've got a, a good gym set up in my garage. And, you know, the, my my kids, my, my daughter, she's two and she's got her one kilo dumbbells. So she's in there training Beautiful. with me. And my son's got his three kilo dumbbells. And when dad's in the gym, they're in the gym. They'll pick up their dumbbells and play around and they'll run off and they'll come back. And, you know, whatever time they can give me, I will take. Um, because it's, it's, I need to remove that stagnant energy. And I also, there's, there's, there's a standard of myself of what I want to see in the mirror. Like sometimes I'm, I'm missing it. And that's okay as long as I know I'm not leaving it all behind. So yeah, cold showers for my my mental side of things. Yeah, the exercise because it's important to move, and my breathing. My breathing, you know, it's when I'm driving home, I I start a nice, I, I breathe to calm myself back down. So when I walk through that door, it's it's a reset. It's Hey kids, rather than like, oh my gosh, I had the worst day ever. And yeah. they and they suffer. Um so breathing helps me reset and you know enjoy my time with my family rather than being reactive. Um and you know, as long as I'm doing those three things, I'm I'm pretty good. And I try to yeah. jump in the ice at least a fortnight. Uh, so you have a nice bath, do you? Or... Yeah, yeah, I've got a nice bath. So, you know, fortnightly, it's it's blown out. So as the family changes and grows and things um, change up, it's like you got to change that schedule. Um, at the end of the day, my family's my priority. So I'll, I'll yeah. move things around to always try to fit things in. But it's, it's yeah, it's nothing is really set in stone, like, when it was just my son, it'd be, okay, I'll, I'll wake up early. I would either train, go for a run, I would breathe, and I had this new butte morning routine. Um, but then, you know, you add another child to the mix, and then it's harder to keep a routine. So I really had to, 
lower my standards of keeping a morning routine. And it was more like, what do I need to do to win? And it's yeah. like, you know what? If I'm having my cold showers at night, it's okay. Because then I'm mentally charged for the next day rather than being mentally charged for the morning of that day. And yeah. then the exercise is like, I just need to exercise. I just Makes need sense, to breathe yeah. because it helps me be the man I want to become or to be the man I am today because yeah. I'm able to respond rather than react. I'm able to sit with my son rather than, um, you know, become this person he's, he's not used to or never seen. So, Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, man. Uh, we, we definitely connect in that. I remember when you started opening up about, I was like, yep, definitely going to get along with you because I do all the same things. I've let myself yeah. go on the exercise bit. I play basketball twice a week, uh, but the morning, uh, since probably this, the, the sun doesn't come up as early here in Victoria, um, that getting over that mental hurdle of going out for a walk. And not that the cold bothers me because it doesn't, but just I think it's just being dark and I, I need to get myself back up and do what you do, those just those sit-ups, those press-ups. I've got a bit of a setup in the garage as well. And I've not touched it for five months. Before that, I was in that routine. So I know I can get back into it. But again, it's just taking those small, simple steps. I said to myself, just tomorrow, I'll do five press ups because the day after yep. I said, I want to do 10, right? And then before you know it, I'll go back to the 100 that I was doing um, and then the <laughs> 150 that I was doing because before I started, I couldn't do one, two push ups. Yep. And then in fact, before you know it, I'm, I can do 150 with my eyes closed, you know, and press ups, uh, sit ups, I was doing up to five, 600 a morning. Uh, and before that, I was struggling with three sets of 15, you know. So, so LJ, the going back briefly, uh, just to maybe 20 minutes ago, when we were talking about the opening of the gym, I, I don't feel like we probably shut that part off. Um, the gym opened when you were 29 on the point that you roughly the rough, rough time of losing your nephew, uh, and meeting Sherelle shortly afterwards. Um, where did your business take did your business take off as a gym? It, you said it was quite a small, intimate gym. Um, where did that journey go? Yeah, it, it didn't go as planned or as far as I, I wanted it to go, to be honest. Um, bringing on family, you know, they always say to mix family and business. And I guess I was naive and like anyone else that probably goes in business with family. And But uh, it really was a strain on my relationships. Um, with my family that I went in on the gym with. Um, we were always fighting, we were always arguing. Uh, it, it just felt like I was always putting out fires at the gym. And, and it got to a point where uh, myself and Sherelle, we just had our, our youngest son, Bowden, and the stress levels was high. That was the first time I felt that anxiety, as we discussed before. Yeah. And it's like, all right, am I going to deal with this or how am I going to deal with this? Uh, so it got to a point where I was like, okay, I've got to let this go. I've got to close down the gym. And coming to that decision wasn't easy because I put everything I had up against this gym so we could create this this gym with, with my family members so to give them something. In my mind anyway, it was like, I'm going to create this because I want to give something to my family that, you know, at, at the time that just didn't have much going on for them. And I wanted to share that with them. Um, so deciding to put myself through bankruptcy, to close the gym down, to step away from the stress and the drama that was happening in the behind scenes was a, a massive decision but once that decision was made, it was a big weight lifted off of me um, because that's not how I wanted to start my journey of fatherhood. You know, I've got my son, he was months old. Here I am, about to put myself through bankruptcy, lose a house that I bought when I was like 22, 23 years old. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.